What a delight it's been to be here in this place. My word, God has placed a deposit in our spirit, hasn't he? The teaching this morning was phenomenal. How'd you like to get up and follow that? <laughs> Someone said to me at lunchtime, do you feel intimidated? Always. Don't you? <laughs> you know. But no, it's just an honour to be here in this place at this time in the history of our nation. For me, it's an honour to uh, be around men like that and women like their wives. Their normalness, their humility, their naturalness and openness about the things of God just does something in your spirit, but it also does something in your soul, doesn't it? Do you feel refreshed? Really feel encouraged, inspired, and refreshed. And uh, Steve preached my favorite message this morning. That is my favorite message. I I heard him preach it at the Harvest uh, Festival conference last year to about 9,000 people. And I sat there, and in the words of Jack Deere, I was spellbound, you know. uh, Don't you love their little, they just don't come out with the normal everyday things that you expect, do they? But I sat there, and I was just so encouraged to know that those who didn't just get a mention in the Bible, but those that featured in the Bible were useless. <laughs> you know? And when, uh, Steve, when they were coming down, I said to Steve, you have to preach that at our open meeting on Thursday night. You've got to. We all need to know how bad they were. You know? Because something inside you responds to the fact that if they can do that, we can do that. Doesn't it? If they can go out into the then known world and present the Lord Jesus Christ, and cover the whole of Asia Minor in two years. What can we do in this little nation of New Zealand? I, um, Rick said to me, so what are you going to speak about this afternoon? And I said, well, I'm going to take what uh, Jack said, and then I'm going to take what Steve said, and I'm going to take what you said, and he said, well, you're going to realign all the theology. <laughs> I said, no. But for me, I have a heart, and the heart is for this nation. God honored me by bringing me to this nation in 1961, and it's an honor that I have never uh, stopped being thankful for. As a 16 and a half year old boy, God called me to this place to get saved, to come and meet his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He took me from one side of the earth to the other to meet his son. And I've often thought, I wonder why he had to take me from one side of the earth to the other to meet his son. It's because Jesus is here. Because you can't meet anybody who's not around people. And so I'm just so thankful and so grateful that God has allowed me to be adopted into this nation. And and today I go back to England and of course there is is, uh, still a tie there. You understand that, you know. But it's not home. It's just not home. This is home. And here's my desire from this weekend when I I first spoke to Rick and I said, Rick, how about coming down again? You know, you, you, you came down 10 years ago. It was the last time you were here. We need you again. We need to hear from the Lord through you. And um, I said, how about bringing a team? He said, should I ask Jack? I said, yeah, ask Jack as well. And how about Steve? And, you know, we even tried to get the whole worship team down, but they said there was no one left if they came. And so they said, we'll send those next year. So we've had the prophetic school for the last 10 days, and next year we're going to have a worship school for two weeks with Susie and Leonard and the team. And they are wild people. If you've ever seen any of their DVD, they are wild, way out there with God people. And it's such a delight. But I can't tell you how grateful I was when he said, yeah, let's do that. He said, there is something that you, this is what he said to me, there's something you have in New Zealand that you don't realize you've even got. The presence and power of God is in your nation. He said, we're not just going to come next year, that's now. He said, we're going to come for the next five years. 
Now, I want to tell you, they have been away for one month, ministering day in and day out. And I want to tell you that it's hugely draining. Hugely draining. The pull of the people, you know, the sucking out of people. And that's what they like, and that's what they want, obviously, and that's their gift, and that's their calling. But they're not here now. They're taking their rests, and they're with their families. And... But I just wanted to honor them before you all. They take a lot of flack for doing what God has asked them to do. Rick hasn't mentioned this, but he, he, when I was up there, um, he said, look, if we come down the next five years and you start, start getting involved in us, uh, you've got to realize that your level of um, difficulties will arise. They'll just go up, you know, like a thermometer, you know. Because he says, we, he said, we have a, a way of attracting um, persecution, you know. You wonder how, with such wisdom that comes out of their lives, don't you? How, how could you criticize what we've heard this morning? How could you, for one minute, say that was not anointed? How could you? To me, it's incredulous. But the accuser of the brethren is always at work, isn't he? And um, he said, I I've got a whole radio program in the States dedicated to putting us down. This is a radio program that comes on every day against Rick Joyner. How would you like that for persecution? Pulling them down, dissecting everything they say, just continually ripping them up. And he said, I said to the Lord, you know, God, this is just getting on my nerves. I've really had enough of that. Lord, God, could you remove them? And he said, God spoke to me really clearly. He said, yeah, who would you like me to replace them with? Like, oh, I'll stick with what I've got, thanks. You know. Why am I saying this? Because as a nation, we have to understand that as we step out in this new life of Christ, as we take upon ourselves the image of Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we start operating in power, there is going to be some fallout. As we start in this nation to become proactive instead of inactive, there is going to be some fallout. We're not going to be loved of all nations for Jesus' sake. In fact, the Bible tells us that, uh, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Woe is the, about the highest curse that can be pronounced in the Bible if you go and look. And Jesus says, woe unto you when everybody's saying how wonderful you are. There's got to be something wrong and there has got to be something wrong. Because we are in a battle, we are in a warfare. The bride of Christ in this nation is putting on army boots. And we're going to go forward in this nation and see it one back to the Lord Jesus Christ. These men don't know our destiny, but we do know our destiny. And our destiny in, in this nation is this. That we are called by the living God to be an example of what God can do in a nation that is totally and absolutely yielded to his purposes. God is calling our nation to be an example to nations. Because when a state in New Zealand hears that with one accord New Zealand has come back to Jesus Christ, they're going to say, but there's only four million of them. We could do that in our state. Now, you might think that that's a huge destiny, but that destiny has been upon this nation for many, many years. We are a mission-sending nation, but to send missionaries, you have a message that goes with the mission. Because if you don't have a, a message, you've got nothing to say on your mission. And God has given us a message. The Bible says that God whistles to the nations. We're from ends of the earth. God, as Isaiah says, God whistles to the nations from the ends of the earth. My Downs boy, he's a, he, he loves walkabout. And sometimes we go out to the beach and he'll just take off into the distance and he's about that big, you know. 
But God bless my wife with the most unbelievable whistle of any woman I know in New Zealand. When she goes like this, you go like that. You know. Demonstrate. Demonstrate. No, we won't do that. And when she whistles, my son can be in the distance that big. And he hears and he turns. And I want to tell you, the nations, we may be in the distance, like Rick said, at the ends of the earth. But when God whistles from here, there's going to be a turning towards this nation. I'm not the, 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 the prophet type, but it's amazing how you get, um, and I'm not saying that disparagingly, but that's not a gift that operates readily in, um, often through our lives to a degree of profoundness. You understand that? We all have the bless you brothers, I know God is going to love you, you know, but to a, a level of profoundness. But I believe God has given me a word for the nation. And it's been burning in my heart for years. For the last 39 and a half, actually. And it's never gone. The word is that this is his nation. And that he loves this nation more than we understand or may ever understand. That his face isn't turning toward this nation. He lives here in the midst of the beauty that he created and that he will whistle to the nations from the ends of the earth. Heads will be turned and we will go out on this mission with a message that has come not from the last set of conference tapes but from the throne room of the living God. This message that he burns upon our hearts as the people of God in this nation that causes us to so walk in humility that the nations are astounded at how we can do that. And I believe that's a grace that God is now placing upon the nation of New Zealand. Now the interesting thing is that I believe God showed me that it's going to be accompanied by an aggressive spirit. Not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. That there is going to be a powerful, aggressive humility operating in our lives and in our nation. That we will be so consumed in this place by God that everything else will pale into insignificance that we will get in New Zealand such a hunger and a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ that people will marvel and scratch their heads and shake their heads and say, but that's New Zealand, that's the place they have about 80 million sheep, don't they? Can anything good come out of New Zealand? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We may be the backside of nowhere as far as most of the world is concerned. But I would encourage you, keep your eyes wide open. Things are starting to happen. Who said watch this spot? Very good. Watch this spot on the globe because the favor of God is in this place. The reason I wanted Steve to preach the message he did today was to encourage us all that we're at least as good as the disciples. Therefore, if they can go and change a whole continent, we can change a nation to begin with. Then we can rise up with the power and authority of God on our lives, understand that, that we are nothing and that he is everything. And I mean a revelation of that, not just the words of that. I mean the revelation of understanding that God is everything. That we are nothing, but through him all things are possible to those who will believe taking upon ourselves the very nature of God, the very form of Jesus Christ, not being ashamed of that, to say it or even to do it, not feeling 
oh, I couldn't do that. I'm not humble enough. Because humility is not thinking little of ourselves. Humility is not thinking of ourselves at all. And I want to encourage you, as I'm encouraging myself this weekend, nothing is impossible to those who would believe. These men God has brought here to inspire us to love and good works. To inspire us to move out into our nation with the power and authority of God upon our lives. We didn't ask them, other than Steve, to preach what they've preached. And they actually have not conferred with one another either. But hasn't it fitted together amazingly? They haven't even been at the other's meetings to hear what the other person has said. Perhaps they didn't want to, being as Rick and Jack are being so rude to one another, you know. <laughs> Don't you love the fun? That's really good. But God has given us a precise message. In fact, within that message is about a hundred, and I think that it's going to take us a long time to get to the stage where we can actually practically apply all the things that we've heard and will hear tonight. But I think it's more than hearing a message, it's catching the Spirit of God that these men carry in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I am hungry for God. I am hungry for God. We were just in Malaysia, Jan and I, and we were in this uh, particular, uh, it was a church camp, it was the biggest church camp they'd had in their history of 40 years. And I said to them, how come it's such a huge camp? And he said, well, you know you dropped in and preached on that Sunday morning, you were going to the airport. And I thought, yeah, but it wasn't that good. But you know what I realized? But God blessed me that morning to step out in the power of the Spirit and have some words for people. And that went around the church. It was an Orthodox church. And we got to this camp, and it was tight. I mean, absolutely tight, down to the minute. We were told what chapter to speak from, what verses to speak from, and basically what we were to say. And we did. You're under authority. Do you know the second day the pastor came? And he said, we feel that the Holy Spirit wants to do something. And we are restricting you, which is restricting him. So what we want to say is, we're going to cut all the notices down, we're going to cut all the worship down, and you can preach the whole morning. And whatever God does, that's fine with us. They didn't know what the gifts of the Spirit even were. They had never seen them, only that Sunday morning, just in a brief manner, operate. They'd heard about speaking in tongues and didn't agree with it whatsoever. And I got up to preach, and as I did, this dear pastor, William, said, you don't have to preach what we said. What we said. You just do what you like. And the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, I want you to share about when you went to heaven. And I find that really difficult. You know, end up a blubbing mess most times, you know. But I did. And the Spirit of God president presenced himself in the place. And people started to weep, and it wasn't just sympathy weeping. And it started to spread through the place. And we felt God said, now minister to the people in their brokenness. Jan went to this young man and went to pray for this young man and he burst out speaking in tongues. <laughs> yeah, it was a like, oops. <laughs> and both of us looked over to the pastor on the front row because he was quite vocally speaking out in tongues. And the person, we said to the person next to him, is he speaking Chinese? And this person said, no. I think He's speaking in tongues. <laughs> We're like, oh, God, help us, you know. And the pastor, God bless men of God. This pastor walked over and he stood there and he said, you didn't instigate this. I didn't instigate this. You haven't even spoken about this. 
He said, let's not stand in the way of the Holy Spirit. Oh, man. Do you know what happened? The whole place erupted. People speaking in tongues everywhere. This is the point I want to make. One lady just ran forward. She just ran forward and she threw herself at me, tears pouring out of her eyes, and she said, I am desperate. An orthodox woman. I am desperate. I am desperate for God. And the Holy Spirit fell on life and she spoke in tongues instantly. So that there was about 15 people or 20 people that were not being touched by the Spirit of God. And God said, ask them if they'd like to be touched by me. So the remainder of you that are not being touched by the Spirit of God, would you like to be touched by the Spirit of God? Would you like to meet with Jesus now? If you'd like to, stand up, raise your hands, and the Spirit of God will come upon you in a way that you've not experienced before. And you know the majority of those people stood up, raised their hands, and the Holy Spirit fell on their lives. One man who was one of the leadership team came running down, and he said, I haven't even believed in this, but I want it so bad. <laughs> and he was just filled with the Spirit and spoke in other tongues. Now, it's not about speaking in tongues. It's about a hunger for God. And I believe God is placing within our hearts and within our lives in this nation a hunger for himself, a hunger for his son, a hunger for the things of the Spirit, a hunger for the gifts of the Spirit, that we might go out with power and authority into our nation. And this is the, where I want to go. And I, I haven't got the time to do this properly. So please, I'm a clumsy person, okay? I, I, what's in my heart never really comes out of my mouth as I really want it to. But hey, I was born like that. When I met my wife, the father-in-law used to see me come and say, quick, move everything, here comes Trev. Because, <laughs> man, I would trip over anything and everything. They even moved the heater and I'd trip over it again, you know, even after they moved it, you know. Clumsy is part of my nature. And I can't help that. But what I want to do today, by the grace of God, that seed that's been implanted in our lives... I'm going to put some fertilizer on it. I want to take it from being a seed, maybe to this afternoon just to shoot out of the ground a little. Because I believe that God is going to make us like an English country garden in this nation. I believe that people are going to pass by this nation or just pass through this nation and they're going to smell the fragrances of springtime. Because we have been plowed. A hey, Russell? We have all been well plowed in the last 10 to 15 years. Anybody who's in leadership here, would you just raise your hand? Have you been well plowed over these last years? I don't think any of us have not been plowed. And I mean, plowing is very painful. But God's got the soil ready, and I believe that God has planted into that soil this weekend. I believe that it's good soil because it's been well turned over a number of times, and all the good nutrients which were down below have been brought up to the surface, and the seed has gone into the... You don't dig a big hole and stick a seed three feet down. You just go like that and drop it in, you know, because you want it to get the sunlight, even though it's a little bit in the dark at that particular time. You want it to feel the warmth. And this afternoon, I really feel that God wants you to feel the warmth of his encouragement upon your lives, that you might be turned toward him to his kindness and his absolute in-depth love for you and for me that will cause a response out of our heart and out of our spirit back to him that says, God, grow me into the full stature of Jesus Christ that I might fulfill my purpose as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a business, that I might fulfill my full potential in this nation and take my part in your history, in your chronology, and cause a change to take place through the full maturity and blossoming of my life. We have a friend in Scotland and... and 
they're wonderful people, ministers there. And they have a truly English country garden. It has about a 16-foot wall around it with a little gate in it. You know, the secret garden thing, you know. But at certain times of the year when you go there, even when you're outside the wall, you can smell the fragrance. It is so strong, you can just smell it. You get out of your car, and the first thing that hits your nostrils is, oh, wow. You know, sometimes a fragrance brings back memories, doesn't it? Many years before. Things trigger off in our mind. I believe that God wants us in this nation to carry such a fragrance that anybody who even gets near here senses the fragrance of the Holy Spirit in our nation. Now, we are known for pioneering. And I believe we're going to start to fulfill a new period in our developmental history. Help me, Ash. Whatever, that's great. That's fine. As we develop (laughs) through these coming years, I believe we're going to develop differently. We're going to understand the appropriateness in our communities and in our businesses and in our workplaces and our educational centers, in our hospitals, in our governments. We're going to understand the appropriateness of applying the power of God in that arena. And here's where I want to go. Would you turn to Psalm 96 with me, please? Can you keep me on time, Ash? Just give me a 10 minutes before. Psalm 96 says this, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord, all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders amongst the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Do you know the Taylor's Living Bible says this? It says, sing a new song to the Lord. Sing it everywhere around the world. Sing out his praises. Bless his name. Each day tell someone he saves. Publish his glorious acts throughout the earth. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does every day. Oh, have I got 10 minutes left? Wow. My word. That went quick. How are we going to publish what God has given us? How are we going to take this power of God, transform it from something that's here to something that's there? Like these guys have spent 10 days, they put aside 10 days, and they've studied and they've learnt, and they've received so that they could come and bring a gift of blessing to you. They've actually studied to show themselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing God's truth. And then they've come and they've given it. Now that's wonderful to have the prophetic gift operating inside the church. But here's my point. We now need to transfer that from the church to our communities. We now need to transfer those prophetic words to the lady in the flower shop who's looking a little bit miserable. To the guy who's dishing out fish and chips in the fish and chip shop. Or the young boy pumping gas at the service station. The solo mum in our community who's feeling lonely and desperate. Those kids on the checkout counter in the supermarket. It's got to go now from where we have seen it operate to where God wants it to fluently operate on a day-to-day basis. We are moving now into a time in our history where the church is going to move into the community, into the workplace, into every arena of society with an appropriate word from God for those who are broken, wounded, and hurt. And that is just about everybody. 43,000 cases reported of our little children being molested in the last year. That is just the reported cases. That stirs something in my spirit 
that says, God, I do not want this to continue. I want to see a nation that honors and glorifies God, is fantastic soil for children to grow up in, that they grow up understanding the knowledge of the living God, not religiousness that puts people off and breaks families, but pure Christianity, truth operating in people's lives with freedom and liberty and anointing in an appropriate manner that causes people's hearts to turn towards heaven and towards home. Where our children love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, where they understand and acknowledge God in all their ways, and from a little age, God is directing their footsteps. That they are beyond their age in spiritual understanding. That as adults, we lay our lives aside and we turn our television off and we start inputting into our young people. That we train them up in the way that they should go, and the Spirit of God joins in with that because it's God's heart and desire that this generation be raised up as a generation to be called by the name of the Lord of hosts and to go out and fulfill their purpose. We sang this to open up the gates we were singing, open up the gates, that the King of glory may come in. The gates need to be opened up, and I'm going to try and condense this into the next seven minutes. And I will be skipping a lot out of my notes. Through the years, the church has become disconnected with society. We have been church-centric instead of community-centric. But I want to point something out to you that we must change. Theoretically, the church is the only organization in this nation that exists for its non-members. Is that sinking in? The church is the only group of people who does not exist for itself but the well-being of others. So as a church, we must leave our pews on a Sunday morning with something in our mind that we are entering our mission field, that we're going out to be a blessing to the nation and the nations. We should not come to church to get, we should come to church to impact one another in a corporate sense as we worship God. It's not, was it a good sermon, but what did I bring into the house this morning? What am I carrying of the anointing of God through spending time and dying to my own wants, wishes and desires on a daily basis? Throughout this last week, what am I bringing to the body this morning? When an unsaved person walks in, what are they going to sense and feel that I have brought with me and my family has brought with me something of the essence of the Spirit of God in our car as we drove? What are they going to sense when they walk in? But more so, what are they going to sense when I walk in the room on Monday morning and hang my coat up and sit at my desk? What are they going to sense that I'm carrying with me? 30 minutes. Oh, God, a reprieve. <laughs> well, with a, what's it, Rick said? The day with the Lord is a thousand years. The bummer about that is a thousand years is one day. You know, it's sort of, we want the other side, don't we? You know. So through the years, the church became disconnected from the community and encapsulated itself within itself. However, in the last few years, an awareness of the counterproductive nature of this culture has led to serious rethinking of the church and its role within society. One thing I believe is that one of the things that we've been caught with is this whole theology of some stuff is spiritual and some stuff is secular. When we pray, we do feel more spiritual, don't we? Than when we're sitting an exam, you know. I never failed an exam in my life. Because I never went in for any, thank God, <laughs> you know. But we certainly feel more spiritual when we're worshipping. Than we, do when we, than we do when we are data entering at work. But you know to God there is no difference because whatever we do, whether we eat, drink, or whatever we do, if we do it to the glory of God, it's our spiritual act of worship. And I want to worship God 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 
I love worship. Didn't the guys do a phenomenal job? I love worship. But that is only one third of 1% of our 168 hours a week. When we stand and we put everything out of our mind and we say, oh Lord, here we are and we want to worship you. Is one third of 1% enough? Does that satisfy the heart of God? I don't believe it does. I believe worship is two way. It should be satisfying to us and satisfying to God like our relationship. Our relationship with God should be satisfying to us and satisfying to the Father. It's, this is a mutual thing. We love Him, He loves us. My, but He loved us before we even knew Him. That's got to be good for you. People loving you before you even knew them? Don't separate the spiritual from the secular. Don't separate the secular from the spiritual. It's all one. Our Christian half an hour or hour and a half or two hours on a Sunday morning. No. Our Christian life. It's our Christian life. Don't separate it. Here's what we're called to be. We're called both to be salt and light. We, we've heard a million sermons, most probably on salt, and most probably on light. I don't know how many you've heard, but an awful lot, you know. I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration. Well, 100,000 then, you know, an awful lot. Here's the thing with salt. It goes into the food and disappears. Here's the thing with light. Everybody sees it. And we're, kind of, we're called to be salt or light. See, we want to make stuff musically, mutually exclusive from one another. So we're not called to be salt or light. It's the sheep or the goats. We, we always want to separate stuff up. We're called to be salt and light. So people, there's some of you sitting here are going to be famous. You're going to be light. People are going to look around because the light came on. You're going to attract people. People are going to be attracted to you. But here's the good news and the bad news, as they were saying this morning. The good news is that light attracts. It also attracts bugs. So you get a dual blessing. The good and the bad get attracted. But thank God that God is calling us to be salt and light. You can't flavor that which you don't touch. So what is the church supposed to do? Be encapsulated within it itself? No, go out and touch something and flavor it. And I know in my spirit, I want to I get more and more into my society, more and more into my community. So I become an inter integral part of the community. So the work that we do and the fabulous people we have around us become a sought-after people. Not a people forsaken, a people sought after. Recently, the economic development manager of the Rodney District came and rang us up and said, hey, can you come and see me? I need to talk to you. And we did, we talked. And he said this, why don't we put a tri-brand together for the benefit of the community? I said, what are you meaning, Steve? What have you got in mind? He said, I've got in mind voiceover broadband telephone for our whole community. On your mast sites, on your TV station mast sites. Because it would take us years to get the resource consents and everything we need to do this. But if you'll join with us, the council, and with a telecommunications company doing a tri-brand, we could actually bring voice over telephone to our community and remove toll calls. Because, you see, if you ring Dairy Flat from Oriwa, which is five minutes away, it's a toll call. God bless Telecom. <laughs> and there was $700 million profit. If you call Helensville to Walkworth, it's a toll call. If Walkworth rings Oriwa, it's a toll call. Everything's a toll call. Millions of dollars worth of toll calls within our own little community. One thing I know, the Bible says we will find our welfare in the welfare of our community. He said, would you like to go and talk this over with your board? And I said, no. 
said, aren't you interested? I said, yes. He said, well, don't you need to talk it over? I said, what's to talk about? It's going to bless every single householder and business in our community. We're Christians, for goodness sake. We're supposed to be doing this stuff. And he said, good, let's do it then, and we're doing it. Here's a really interesting factor. You want to know what's really interesting? Did you read the paper on Friday, I think it was? Telecom are now considering Helensville, Walkworth, Oriwa, making them toll free. Don't you love to be the head and not the backside? You say, we're only Christians. No, we can exert a godly influence in our community. We can exert a godly influence in our nation. My man said to me, he said, we get this through. He said, that sets a precedent for every other area in the country. Yes. Salt and light. Well, they say put it on the top of a candlestick. We're putting them on top of, of huge masts. Let's shed this light. Let's be who we are. Let's appropriately take... The, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Do you know what happened? When I walked into his office and sat down, he started talking about all sorts of things. And I got, a, I got a, just a word from the Lord. What do you want, Steve? That was the word from the Lord. What do you want? And he said, was it that clumsy? I said, no, but obviously you want something. Tell me what you want. And then he told me. I just love going into positions like that. Somewhere the other day with the civil defense, what are you getting involved with all these people for? Because they're my people. I rub shoulders with them every day. I live in the area. I, I'm, I, I'm attached to those people. Say, are they all Christians? No. But how am I going to be light and salt if I don't rub shoulders with them, if I don't get into their meal? But I don't like people that smoke. It makes my clothes smell. I don't want to be rude, but who gives a damn about how our clothes smell? I tell you, there's a smell that's far worse than smoke on your clothes, and that's that one that comes out of hell. The people every tick of the clock go into. So how are we going to appropriately apply what God has given us this week? We're going to go out in the power and authority of God with an appropriateness that Christians have never had before, with the wisdom and understanding that people have never had before as Christians. We're not going to go out with, hallelujah, praise the Lord, brother. Ho, ho, I was praying for a car park this morning on my way to work. Have you ever done that in your office and seen the reaction on people's faces? I tell you, bringing reformation is not sticking a Jesus sticker on your desk for everybody to see. It is not. What it is, bringing reformation is living like a believer in the world today, honoring and glorifying Jesus Christ every moment of every day by our attitudes, by our life. Spiritual warfare, the greatest act of spiritual warfare was on the cross of Calvary, operated by the Lord Jesus Christ. When he finished that, he just said, it's finished. And he put out his arms. Do you know that act of spiritual warfare was going in the opposite spirit? Judas came up and kissed him on the cheek, for goodness sake. And Jesus called him friend. I don't believe we've got to go beat the air. I believe we've got to go and be salt and get involved. How are we going to change the fabric of our community if we're not in the working parties that are looking at the social situation within our community? How are we going to take the influence of... Well, we're going to pray. Of course we're going to pray. But prayer on its own is not good enough. Every prayer warrior needs a project. And every Nehemiah who's got a project needs a prayer warrior. We need one another. Every gift that God has given us should be working together and operating together for the glory of God. If we don't get out of our salt shakers, God may bring persecution to spread us out like he did in the early church. For me, I want to get out of the salt. I don't want to go lumpy in that salt shaker. You know, I don't want to have people with a knife trying to get the bottom off it. You know? And then saying, honey, this salt's hopeless. You know? I want to be fresh salt, running, movable, not blocked, not lumpy. But salt that's dry, thirsty, hungry for God. 
Salt that's got its original flavor. Salt loses its flavor so easy. Being community-centric requires the church to contribute and cooperate with other God-placed influences and authorities within the framework and structure of our community or our city or our region. Now, this is not all original material. I want to give credit where it belongs. In the mid-90s, Lauren Cunningham started talking about uh, authorities within a community. In the early 90s, Landa Cope started speaking about the gates of a community. Uh, Ed Delph, Ed Savoso now are talking about this. After they found out that the revival that they had in Argentina didn't produce the fruit that everybody was looking for. And their comment was this in a letter to the church. Their comment was this, do not make the mistakes that we've made. We encapsulated the revival within our churches. We took upon ourselves the joy of the renewal, the moving of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we did not take it to our community. And now our greatest need in Argentina, they said in this letter, our greatest need is for safety. Anarchy is now in the streets. Things are out of control. There is no law and order anymore. After having the greatest revival in human history, it has come down to, I can't even walk on the streets. I want to learn from their failure. Yes, I want us all to be incredibly blessed, but we have already on Calvary. We shouldn't be looking for any more. We should be looking to be a blessing, to honor God in all our ways, honor our fellow man. Love this nation of New Zealand that God has so graciously given to us. Bob Jones said recently, the safest place in the world today is New Zealand. Do you understand? We are living in the safest place in the world. But let's not take that for granted. Let us use this time to develop and to grow and to honor God. So there are five, I believe, personally, there are five spheres of influence within any community, and they're designed to serve the community. And here's the five. Church, local government, business, education, and media. All communities have these five authority or influence structures. Note that the strategic alliance of these entities is essential for the community to reach its maximum potential. Each entity has a unique function and purpose to contribute to the well-being and growth of the whole community. None of these should exist for itself, but for the betterment of the community. Each should make its unique contribution. Over many years, I've heard the church say, and I've heard this preached, I've heard it spoken out so many times, the church is the authority. No, the church is one of the authorities that God has placed within a community because all authority is given by God and we're encouraged to obey that authority. Scripture tells us that. I haven't got time to go into that, but you know that. So let me just quickly look through these five spheres and then let me round things up. Number one, the church. Let's think about it as a body. The church is the heart of a community. The church contributes the essential core character values necessary in society. We all know that. Values of respect. Honesty, integrity, authenticity, diversity, and morality, without which a community will soon find itself in a downward spiral. Without this contribution of values and spiritual awareness, the community will underachieve and find it impossible to realize its maximum potential. The church has a tremendous part to play. I was on the, on the phone just the other day to these, these, these men, and one of them swore, and the moment he swore, he said, oh, I'm so sorry, Trev. I didn't say anything about swearing. I didn't say anything. Have you ever done that? Walked into a room and someone's cursing and swearing, and you walk in and they go, hello, uh, oh, hello. It immediately modifies their behavior, your presence, because you carry something. I carry something. It's the anointing power and presence of God. Morality, authenticity. That's what we're to bring into our communities. We need to be carriers of that stuff and take it into our community. So the church is the heart. Local government or government is the skeletal structure of a community. Society or country. How about this? Romans 13.1 says this. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers because there is no power but of God. The powers that are ordained are ordained of God. We are to be subject to those powers within our community. We all know that. We don't drive on whatever side of the road we want to. 
We're subject to those powers. They say, you will drive like this, and you will drive at this speed. And you will have your, your rear vision mirrors pointed in the right direction, by the way. And you will have lights front and back. And they will wink if you want to go to the right or the left. Have you noticed that we're told exactly what to do? And we don't complain about it only in the church, but I'll leave that till later. Government supplies the chain of authority and leadership in the community. Government sets up the boundaries that regulate and order community life. It collects taxes, builds infrastructure, and protects its citizens from those that would break the law and bring harm to the community. That's the local government's function. Okay, business. So we've got, a, we've got a heart, we've got a skeleton. We've got the heart as a church, the skeleton is a local government situation. Business. Business is the economic, or economic blood flow into a community. It's amazing how often in the New Testament God talks about business, Jesus talks about business. Even when his parents turned up and he's a little boy, he said, I'm about my father's ministry. You know, don't you remember that? No. So I'm about my father's business. Then he gives 10 talents and five talents and, you know, he gives his talents out to people to go make money with in business. And the guy who's miserable and doesn't do that, he gets rebuked for not using the money that God had given him in business. I mean, there's lots of examples. I won't go on. That's enough because of time. Business and those employed by businesses are designed to have an enormous role in the creation of wealth for a community. It is this flow of finance that stabilizes and brings life to a community. The ability to create goods and services, make profits, provide employment, pay taxes to local government, tithes to the local church, and school fees all come from this arena. They come from the blood flow of business within our community. Business is an absolutely essential part of community transformation, community enhancement, and a community's future. And I'd like you to really ponder that for a little while. We've come to a time when Christian business people now have a real desire to participate in holistic development using their financial and technical resources within and outside of their communities. These were exciting times. However, there was something important to know. The impact for good of this integration of business and church and community development is dependent on the heart motive behind it. You might notice I'm not using religious terminology on purpose. Because my message cannot just be for the church if we're to work with the community. I was tossing up when I was speaking at Rotary just a couple of weeks ago whether I would actually preach this message at Rotary or not. Because those Rotarians are totally open. As it was, we had an amazing time. We ended up an hour and a half after talking about the Lord. Why? Because we just operate appropriately and drop all our Christianese. Well, bless the Lord, brother. Hallelujah, I'm just walking with the Lamb. You know? Well, I'm washed in the blood. That's a good one. Ooh, sheesh. You, know. you understand? It does not sound very good out there. Change your terminology. Use ordinary English that we can all understand. It's very, very helpful. You know? Then whatever you say is appropriate to everywhere you go. No matter whether you're in a business situation, sitting in a boardroom with all people who don't know the Lord, or whether you're in a, in a boardroom in a church. It's all the same. The rain does rain on the just and the unjust, I think. It's, uh, the sun shines on the just and the unjust. I read that somewhere. It's just somewhere I read that. Yeah. Anyway. Education. Education. It's a, it's, it's, uh, education is vital to any community or society. Without it, people become diseased, drink brown water, fail to bring up their children in an orderly way, are unable to handle finances and can't even read the bills that local government send to them, which is a tragedy. Um, education enables better health, wealth, and understanding. Now, as New Zealanders, we have got to rid get rid of this money attitude we have. We have to get rid of this poverty mentality we have got. Come on, the church is not supposed to be paupers. We are not church mice. We are warriors in the kingdom of the living God. Don't be frightened of finances. I preached a sermon at our church once, making money and loving it. Man, I want to tell you, every religious spirit manifests about that time. 
But God talks about it all that. He talks more about money than he does about prayer. I'm sure he made a mistake in the New Testament. Speaks more about money in the New Testament than he does about worship. Can you believe that? Education, the brain. Okay, so we've got a, a heart, we've got a skeleton, we've got some blood being pumped around it, and we've got a brain now. Education is vital to any community or society. Without it, people get diseased, drink bound water, so on and so forth. Education enables better health, wealth, and understanding. Education is all part of man subduing and filling the earth. What does Steve say? My whole thing is training. That's education. We've been sitting here today being educated in the things of God. Education is all part of man subduing and filling the earth. All over the globe where education is lacking, communities miss their full potential. Go to India. You remove education and the children, I mean, it's just, it breaks your heart. And I mean, it breaks your heart. You have so many emotions going all at once, you don't know what to do with yourself. As you see the tragedy of whole areas without any education. Then there's media. Media are the eyes and ears of a community. Media is the eyes and ears. Has authority. Media and entertainment represent the senses of a community. Media operates like the nervous system. It reports what's going on and gives feedback, enabling communication and community awareness. Media is an outlet for the arts, sports, news, and other essential elements necessary for the well-being of any community. I trust this is making sense. But without essential core values given by the heart, the church, what do we get? We get media who actually make news rather than reporting the news. You get major international newspaper editors confessing that they are making up stories to put on their front pages. In New York recently. Can you believe this? Because there is not the core values that the church brings to the mix. Now, these five authorities are not supposed to compete against each other. They are supposed to complete one another. People say, what are you into animation for? Because it's entertainment and it influences. And when we're now reaching over 100 mil million children a day in 52 nations, that is influencing children, helping them grow up in the way they should go. When we first started that, people said to me, you've lost your anointing. It wasn't mine in the first place. Why are into TV the same thing? To put a straight stick next to the crooked one. One day we had 70 people ring us up, 70 parents ring us up, and I could only ascertain maybe one or two that were Christians, all the rest were non-Christians, thanking us for putting on TV that they could sit their children in front of. That was the best day we had. Being relevant to our community, taking what God has placed within our lives, those gifts, those callings, that prof prophetic anointing that's coming upon all of our lives for our nation, taking it out and being industrial prophets, getting into a boardroom and prophesying what's going to take place in the company. And when they don't know what to do, you just bring a word of wisdom. And they say, shoot, where did that come from? And you say, I don't know, it just happens to me all the time. <laughs> Not, oh, well, it's God. You know, we don't have to just be ourselves. That's all. We don't have to be anything else. Five minutes. Thanks, Sam. You had to stand up for five minutes. These, uh, the importance of these five facets of a community structure working together cannot be overstated. Each is unique but must make uh, must work in harmony to bring a community to its fullness, completeness, and purpose. When any of these one spheres of influence thinks it's the sphere, everybody loses. Everybody loses. The church was never designed by God to exist alone. It needs the other entities to bring their contribution to find its potential and maximize that potential. As we've started to get involved with our community, it's amazing what has taken place. Now, we have this, uh, we had three years ago, Pete and Rhonda, they're, they're here with the young people. Um, they put on a community event. They, 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 instead of having, you know, Sky Forks, um, no, Guy Forks. Instead of having Guy Forks, they decided they'd have Sky Forks. 
So they changed the name a little bit and put on a community event for families and 900 people turned up in a community of just over 2,000. The second time that they did it, 6,000 people turned up. And last year, we had our first major traffic jam ever seen in Snell's Beach, Walkworth. Yeah. My wife and I said to my wife, come and look at this. It was a mess and we did it. It was so great. You know, for over an hour, cars just back to back, not able to move. Because some Christians put on an event in the community that not only the community came from, but every, every other Tom, Dick and Harry around the whole place came to it as well. And the mayor said, that was fantastic. You've got to do that every year. We said, sure. Because we're here to serve our community, to bless our community. I had business people ringing me up. And they said, that was fantastic. Tell them to come and see me when you do it next, because I want to put some money into that. Not, will you help us, please? But hey, can we help you? Why? Because the church is doing what the church is supposed to do. Get out there and be salt and light. And is it so exciting? Because they actually talk really nicely about you. Even the local publican, when the newspaper went to them and said, what do you think of this Lifeway crowd down the road? Are they doing all right? He said, oh, they're doing a hell of a job. <laughs> I thought that was okay. I thought that was a good compliment. Maybe it would have been better if he said they're doing a heaven of a job, but I, I can take hell. That's all right. That's, that's not too bad. Okay, remember the church is the heart of the community. The, the heart is for the body, not the body for the heart. Deserves a second thought, that one. Community spheres of influence were designed to complete one another, not compete with one another. Healthy communities come from healthy spheres of influence working together in strategic alliances and mutual collaboration for the betterment of the whole community. Ultimately, we and our families benefit. Three years ago in Boulder, California, uh, it was uh, Boulder, California, Boulder, um, Colorado, both begins with C. Anyway, three years ago, it was recognized as one of the centers of the occult in, the, in America. It was also recognized as a area where it was very, very hostile, hostile media against Christianity. And this is what took place. A businessman, a well-known Christian businessman, asked if all the spheres of authority of Boulder, Colorado, would meet together with the church leaders for a time of dialogue and discussion to benefit the community. All major departments came to that meeting. They asked questions. What, what would we all like to see take place in our community? And they came up with answers. Here's, here's a question that really caused something. In each of our spheres of influence, what is the problem that we face that has no earthly solution. Good way to get in the back door. And one of the men stood up and gave a passionate plea for the children of the community to be supported. Not a Christian man. Here's what's happened in the last three years in Boulder. The church is no longer ridiculed. The church is esteemed. They do not get bad press. In fact, they get brilliant press. And the press have published that the church in Boulder is the single greatest contributor, both in finances and manpower, to every social agency in the city. That's the church at work in the community. Now, I'm not going to go any further with this. I've got another 18 pages, most probably. But. but here, this is the challenge for us all. Are we going to take this power of God, this anointing of God, this authority of God, take it out into our everyday life and impact our community? First of all, let's impact our family. Let's impact our children. Let's live like believers in our home because a man is who he is in his own home. Let's live in a way that glorifies and honors the Lord Jesus Christ before our children and our grandchildren. 
Let us be examples to them of how the power of God looks in an ordinary man or a woman. Let's take it from our home to our churches on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whenever it may be. Let us corporately join together with the power and anointing of God upon our lives. And let's see that released in a corporate way in worshiping, glorifying God. Then thirdly, let us take that to our city. Wherever you're from around this nation, let us take it back. Some of you are from Australia. Let, let us take this back with us. Let us start to understand that whatever you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God and your spiritual act of worship, and God is well pleased with it. God loves us lifting our hands and worshiping on a Sunday morning, but He wants our life to be an offering of worship. As Rick said this morning, and that's, uh, we all, do you understand everybody pinches everybody else's? Have you noticed that? They, they actually say other, what the other one said. Because when you spend a time together, you grow like one another. I want to finish what Rick said because it didn't come from Rick. That came from Francis Frangipane, what he said this morning. There's two people in this world that want you dead. Now, this is the, the full, you know, this is the unabridged, or abridged version, what they got. Unabridged version. There's two people that want you dead. The devil and God. And Francis says, you get the choice of which one, who kill, which one kills you. Now, as Christians, we need to die that we might live. Our old selfish nature, our old pride, only through pride comes contention. This nation has a pride thing that has been upon it for so many years, and that is why we've had so many church splits. Only through pride comes contention. But as we walk in humility and the power of God, my word, God is going to do something in this nation. So my challenge is take what we've got back to where we've come from. Let us do it with great humility, but not inactively, but proactively. Let us turn off the box, and if there is an opportunity to write to a parliamentarian. Do you know I was speaking to a number of the parliamentarians this week in, on the telephone? And one of them said to me, do you know we have worked our butt off to get in here? And from the day we did, all we've had is criticism. Let's just write him a few letters to say, man, you're doing a good job. You're doing your best, and God is with you. And boy, you're learning quick. Keep it next time and the next time, and in 15 years you'll be doing it brilliantly. Because you can't have it all at once, line upon line. Let's be proactive in everything. Let us not be super glued to our pews anymore, but let us get out of the church car park. Let us back out of the park up, car park up and get on the main highway for the glory of God. Let us make the major the major, and let us not dishonor one another, but let us honor one another. Let us not dissect one another as we've been taught this weekend. Let us not look for the exception, but let us look to be exceptional. Amen? Amen. Stand on your feet, please. You must remember those pleases. Lord, I want to thank you for this wonderful nation of New Zealand. God of nations, at your feet in the bonds of love we meet here this weekend. Lord, we ask you that you'd hear our prayer, you'd hear our cry. Lord, some of us can't articulate it like we'd like to. But Lord, you hear the expression of the heart because the highest form of prayer has no words whatsoever. Lord, take what is issuing from our heart towards you. Hear the cry of this nation, Lord. May our prayer come up to you as a sweet-smelling incense but it may return to this nation from you, Lord, as thunder to come and change what is necessary to be changed. Lord, may we see Jesus lifted up and glorified. May we see our parliamentarians on their knees before the living God. Father, may we see this a nation that is a safe place to bring up our children in. Father, may we see crime rates just decrease and decrease and decrease. Father, our young Maori men who populate 90% of our maximum security prisons Father, I pray for your spirit to come upon their lives. Oh, God, do something. Raise them up, Lord, to be the warriors for the kingdom of God, Lord, that you want them to be. May their energies not go into crime, but, Lord, may their energies go into the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Father, we declare a release over the Maori population of this nation. Lord, we declare a release to them. Be released to meet your destiny. Be released to meet your calling, we declare in Jesus' name. And everybody said, yes.
God bless you all.